one of my old school friends, a, la- a lady called Jane Moschetti. She's formerly known as Jane Crompton, who now lives in Australia. Uh, Jane says, Ian, wasn't your dad a blacksmith in Skillington? Or maybe your grandfather a blacksmith? Yes, I was a blacksmith in Skillington. My father before me and my great-grandfathers and my grandfather, to my knowledge, have all been blacksmiths from 1666. So it goes back quite a long way then. Um, So Cheryl uh, was asking, uh, did you follow in the family tradition and and follow in your father's footsteps in the trade? Yes, I did follow in my father's footsteps, although my mother wanted me to be a clergyman. But uh, having to travel the distance to London was not an easy thing to do in the 40s. So how long did you actually work in the trade of blacksmithing? Well, coming up towards being 80 now, I've been in the blacksmithing uh, business for over 60 years. So I, I, I have a little bit of knowledge as regards with being with my father for 30-odd years. OK. Um, the, the first question um, that I really have on the issue, on the subject of blacksmithing... What is a blacksmith? Well, a blacksmith is a person who works with mainly iron and steel. Going back to the 40s time, we could, we could get both iron and, and steel combined, which was uh, the iron was the easiest to work upon, but the steel was better to use as regards the end product. So who would your customers have been? Well, we had several customers in the uh, in the district around Grantham. With the shoe inside of it, the Le Marchant family from from Ungerton. We had the uh, uh, Newton family from Skillington, and we also had uh, uh, Lord Dysart's work from Buckminster. So, a, a lot of your customers uh, were aristocracy then. Yes, they were aristocracy, and. Uh, I still keep uh, uh, an open mind with the uh, people that I used to uh, be a be a workman for them, so they they uh, mean a lot to me in that respect. The, just talking about a little bit about the history and the community of blacksmithing, um, Gary Doolan asks, uh, where does the name blacksmithing come from? Well, the the name blacksmithing comes from the early ages. It was. Uh, it's never been known when the blacksmith's uh, business really started. The word smithing originates from various communities. Uh, it originates from the gypsies of Romania and also from Southern Ireland and other parts of the, the world like um, the middle of Europe. India and uh, various other parts of the world going right down back to China. OK, thank you for that. Uh, Darren Arnold uh, is, is asking, one question I would probably ask, he says, is how has the modern era affected blacksmiths as a whole, as I'm sure this must be a struggling trade nowadays, although I understand the black country in the West Midlands is probably the only thriving example of the trade. Yes, I dare say it had it has taken a downside, uh, the smith inside of it, uh, and there's not so many I don't think about as they used to be. In my early early uh, days as an apprentice, there were there used to be about fifty lady blacksmiths in the country, uh, and about uh, three or four thousand uh, blacksmiths themselves. So uh, in in the time that has gone by, blacksmithing has taken a downside as regards the farrier side of it was separated from the smithing. So if you either became a, a farrier or you be, or you stuck to it and became a, a blacksmith through industry or there was a, a training programme set out by the, the government just after the war called the Rural Industries Bureau. And all apprentices had to be signed up to do a certain period of time with the rural industries. And if you you didn't attend any of the uh, day work which we 
used to set aside for one day of the week, then uh, they would uh, come to you at your own workshop and uh, they would train you to be in for welding and electric welding, gas welding and all sorts of things in that nature. Margot Smithers is asking, how many blacksmiths are there today compared to, say, 50 years ago? I don't think there's quite so many blacksmiths because they're not being able to train them as they should be be trained. Every every village locally used to have probably one and two blacksmiths in the village, but now this is uh, gone completely, and uh, you you may find blacksmiths in industry assigned to such people like the shipping industry and and uh, the Birmingham smiths like the chain makers and and all those type of uh, people in the black country. You, you must have known a lot of blacksmiths in the area, in the Grantham uh, and uh, surrounding district. Um, are there uh, any that you remember very well, and what kind of characters were they? Yes, I do remember some of the uh, local blacksmiths uh, in the uh, district. A lot of the uh, blacksmiths that I, I do remember, they're quite religious type of people, and they used to uh, have certain ways in which they'd, they'd call, call themselves characters and uh, there was quite amusing to work for although it was you had to have a certain amount of discipline to be with these people and if you didn't uh, have that discipline you'd get ignored by the by the smith himself he wouldn't take the biggest amount of interest in you so you had to uh, look around and see with the smiths that were in the area and uh, I can remember on several occasions where there's been uh, smiths that uh, that are uh, about in the area, but no longer that they come to mind with me. Mr. Jordan, he was uh, chairman, and he had the blacksmith shop at uh, Belton. There was uh, Baxter's of Grantham and Shelford's of Grantham. All people that uh, were humorous type of people, had good characters, and, and they were also... Uh, obliging people and you had to be in that sort of way of life and in that sort of community with them the trade of blacksmithing was it a tough trade did you need to be physically fit and be able to be strong to be able to do the job yes you you, you had to be reasonably fit to do this uh, type of job it wasn't a brute force job you, you got into it and you always seemed to find an easier way of doing these uh, jobs. And uh, there was not so much uh, uh, brute force, as, uh, as, a, as I say, but uh, you found this easy way of doing it. And, and these things used to come as, as a matter of time and through your experience on different jobs that you was uh, having to cope with. Cheryl, how long was your average working day? Well, the average working day, they were long days. Uh, we used to have to start at uh, seven in the morning and uh, there was always a, it was a three meal, four meal day on those uh, occasions where we used to have a, a breakfast at, at 8.30, go back to the workshop at nine o'clock and you'd work through till one for your main meal then you'd go in the afternoon until five o'clock and you'd go home for a light tea. And then after that, you would go until uh, probably eight or eight thirty in the evening. Would you suggest that today many youngsters wouldn't know what a hard day's work really is? I don't think they would. They wouldn't. Uh, they, they would uh, like to do it probably, but uh, having a couple of three days, it would soon uh, get into them. And I'm afraid. Uh, they wouldn't enjoy the uh, pattern of work that we had to do. You had to be very interested at that time in which to uh, continue and uh, and keep that uh, way of life going with you. Moving on to the work of a farrier, many people also think of the work of a blacksmith as someone who puts shoes on a horse. Uh, would you just like to um, say what a, a farrier is? Yes, yes. Uh, the, the smith inside of it and the farrier were a combined uh, uh, business in those days and uh, we had to uh, do the two jobs together and uh, making of the shoes and, uh, and also uh, 
putting the shoes onto the uh, horses themselves. We, we had those jobs in which to do and prepare prepare uh, everything for uh, each particular animal. Cheryl's asking um, one or two questions about the work of a farrier. She's asking, what materials did you use to make horseshoes and how did you put the holes in the horseshoes? Yes, yes, we uh, mainly the, the shoes were made uh, of iron. We, as I say, we could buy the strip uh, strip metal at the time. Iron was easier to work upon than steel, and it used to go through a process of uh, of hardening the iron as best we possibly could to make the shoe wear as long as it would. Now, to put the, the nails uh, holes into the metal, you needed a top stamp, and it would uh, be tapered like a like a hammer with a point on the top. So as you hit the you hit the hammer. And with the with the tapered point into the metal, and it would it would uh, give you the impression for the nail to go through. How long does it take to make a set of horseshoes? Make a set of horseshoes, a reasonable sort of horseshoes, in about three quarters of an hour. That's how long it would take uh, to, uh, to to get the iron cut, and also to uh, prepare it, and also clip it, clip the toes, or the, give it a side clip, whatever. Uh, we he was wanting to do for the iron iron shoes and also just a, a toe clip on the on the front shoes. What's the biggest horseshoe you've ever made? The biggest horseshoe I should say that uh, we we ever made uh, would be for a shire, and uh, th- these uh, these uh, shoes were made for various types of shires like the uh, uh, the Clydesdale or the Percheron or the. The smaller animals, the, 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 like the Suffolk Punch, they were they they would be uh, not the the biggest of foot for for the uh, for the uh, animal concern, but going into uh, show showing horses, they always like to see a good big foot, and therefore the the, the uh, shoe would would be quite considerably bigger for the show horses than it would be for the working animals. When putting horseshoes on a horse, do the horses feel any pain? Not particularly any pain. They don't, uh, they don't feel that the pain uh, as such. It's a method as you go through and the process that you go through uh, by how you treat the animal, how you, how you uh, know the animal and the animal knows you. And they, they give to certain things like... Uh, uh, if you if you go through f- the first procedure, like to give the horse a good pat on the on the on the neck, and also run your hand around his nose, let him smell you and know what you you're about, and uh, just pick his foot up, and uh, mainly his his near fore would be to start with, and uh, give him a, give him a clean his clean uh, his foot out with your with your paring knife. And uh, let him know what you're doing, and after a while, uh, through their own experience, they uh, they get to know you, and you you start to uh, uh, just uh, tap on his uh, hoof and and chop his hoof down, and in, with a towing knife and and uh, your, your pincer cutters, and then you would uh, start to fit the shoe, and he would uh, the horse wouldn't uh, wouldn't move that much about it unless it was in him to do this. Uh, but you'd go through the process of of being kind with him and let him know how you was uh, going to go, be about him, and he would respond to that to that effect. Did you come across many horses that didn't like uh, their shoes being put on? That are difficult to shoe. Many many horses we, we've come across that, that were difficult to shoe, and in particular some of the. Uh, horses that were uh, shot in those particular times they uh, they were working animals and working animals had to be fed with the right proper food and in in the process that uh, that they were fed then they used to respond by the by the way in which they uh, wanted to get it out of their system and you could only get it out of their system by working them and through that process if a horse had been working all day, he'd be tired. He would come back, and that's when probably the farrier or the blacksmith would uh, would have him to be shod for the next working day. Some horses are uh, shod uh, with a a hot horseshoe, and some a cold horseshoe. And can you just explain why there's hot shoeing and cold shoeing? Yes, I can explain this to you. Mainly in those days, the horses used to be brought to the workshop. Now, going back into the 50s, there was no such things like the mobile 
forges that you can uh, fire and which you can carry around as you as you uh, do today. But uh, it was always best to shoe the horse with a hot shoe. It would fit nicely and snugly down on his on his foot, and he would he, he would have this uh, shoe fitted nicely. It would never move or, or anything of that nature in the time that he was going to have it on. Going on to the cold side of shoeing, all things had to be made in the workshop before you went out. You take a little anvil or something of of that uh, kind of thing with you, so you could alter the shoe if it wanted to, to be altered. You, you always had to alter the shoe to fit the foot and not the foot to fit the shoe. So that was how the process of uh, cold shoeing we had to go through. Now I've got a question here coming in from Francis who's asking about racing plates and shoes with colkins and corrective shoeings and also studs. Um, what are colkins and also corrective shoeing, and, and why would uh, studs be used on shoes? Thank you, Francis, for your question. A good one, nice one. Yes, um, I can explain to you the, uh, the, the uh, racing plates, which were made, as you know, through very, very light material, only about a quarter of a pound in uh, each uh, shoe, and uh, they, would be, they would be fitted with considerable amount of uh, of nail holes because of uh, taking them off and putting them on which had to be done probably in about of a couple of three days notice from working shoes to racing plates and back to and back to working plates after after they've been racing now going on to the corkins well we used to put corkins probably on the uh, inside and outside of uh, various horses a lot depended on their stance and how they would uh, be standing. Some horses used to walk on their reels, and so we had to put corkings on the reels. Also, uh, another point that I'd like to make about about corkings, and that is corkings would be put onto the outside of a horse's uh, ironed shoes, and th- there is a, another reason for this particular c- question, and that is the corkings on the outside would bring the horse up uh, in his stance to a, another half inch or three quarters of an inch from when he was uh, standing and also it was always prone that sometimes a horse's stifold could be put out and so in the in the nature of putting a cork in on the outside of the uh, of the shoe would help to keep the stifold back in its place and now also uh, we used to put in on those particular days in about the early 50s would be a mordax stud or a screwed stud in which we could take in and out and a lot depended on how the horse used to wear his, his shoes down on the outside how long would a set of shoes normally last a horse this a set of shoes a good set of shoes uh, looking at whatever particular size they were thickness they were you'd always always got to about a good eight weeks of uh, shoe time with them probably a little longer but at the same time you've got to have that shoe removed and, uh, and replaced because of the growth of the foot the growth of the foot in about six weeks would be somewhere in the region of about three three eighths to a half inch deep so you'd have to take that off failing to do this it can be consequential it's a very important thing to have your shoes changed because it is possible to cause an overreach by the animal when he's starting to gallop and if you ever know what an overreach can the consequences can be then that uh, they need to be changed in that period of time excellent thank you very much indeed i'm going to ask you now about agricultural engineering blacksmiths they did a lot of work for local farmers and this work is known as agricultural engineering what jobs did you do for local farmers well in in uh, in these uh, days gone by the the, the uh, there was always four seasons in a year and in in that time we used to have to work with farmers which were starting with uh, w- with the spring of the year that you'd always got to produce to get their get their disc arrows right you got to get their ordinary arrows right 
you've got to make arrows or you've got to uh, do the chain arrows for the grass side of it and uh, you'd go on to do the uh, other things when it came to a time and harvest time with uh, preparing uh, reapers and preparing binders combines as they are today and then going back again because you in those days there was a farrowing period following period in which you had to uh, get get the ground ready for the oncoming winter winter months when you would be uh, putting in the seed corn for winter for winter corn and then you'd be going up to the christmas period and you'd be into root crops and things like this all these um, tools that you needed for each each uh, comparable uh, time you had to have them ready and uh, done for that that time of that came along so what actually are chain arrows chain arrows are are arrows that um, you pull behind uh, they used to used to have them with horses and they used to have them with uh, mainly now with tractors and they always used to have chain arrows to pull out the the dead grass and uh, across the uh, mainly the grasslands where a tractor could get in it was always good to see a, a good set of chain arrows go across the grassland and rake out all the the moss and things like that that had culminated over a period of time and you could notice the distant difference in the time that uh, in a matter of a week the, the new growth of grass would be coming along. So which part of the chain arrows would you need to repair? Well, we used to have to... Have to th- th- these were th- these were complicated uh, sets of uh, arrows, but they always needed to be pointed down so they, they would... Uh, you could uh, sharpen them in some some way. You could... you, you the, uh, the arrows that we used to make, you could turn them over and use one way or the other. One side had a long, had a long tine and the top side had a short tine. So whatever the grass you was working upon, if it was a if it was a rough period, it, then you'd probably want to use the long long side of it. So you'd you'd have the choice of which you you either wanted to use the long time or the short time. What what other things did you do for uh, farmers? Did you make um, sheep pens, metal sheep pens, and farmyard uh, gates and uh, field gates? Yes, made several uh, field gates and uh, and uh, things of that nature for the for the, uh, the fabrication side of it. Uh, also, uh, various tools and uh, and uh, things of that nature that needed to be uh, done for whatever uh, job that came along. I'd like to ask you a question about wheelwrights. The, the trade of wheelwright is associated with the work of a blacksmith. What is a wheelwright? Yes, a, a wheelwright is is a person who works uh, with uh, timber and uh, artish kind of wood in making uh, all types of uh, uh, carts and uh, wagons and uh, drays of that uh, nature. And uh, also uh, it'd be, we'd be... I was uh, fortunate at the time that my uncle Stimson, who was uh, a wheelwright, and we uh, he always used to uh, make his uh, rims for the wheels and all the fittings that go with uh, with the wheels themselves. Did you use special tools for wheelwrights? Yes, you do need special tools. You you need a lathe. Uh, and um, various other other types of tools, fairly good chisels, chisels and fairly good uh, planes of that uh, nature, and and uh, you'd need uh, all types of uh, of uh, tools that uh, like like draw knives and uh, and spoke shaves and and all those type of tools that uh, come into the wheelwrights uh, business. So it was a very specialised uh, trade then? It was a very specialised trade and I always remember my uncle when he'd uh, made a, a cart or a wagon or, 
or, or a little uh, Ann Barra. It was always perfect in in the way that uh, it was made, and uh, I really enjoyed uh, being in his company. I was only a young boy, a lad at the time, but I do remember on those occasions that he had uh, all these uh, things. Uh, he, he, he was a, a, a guy that uh, he spent all his life in, in making uh, these types of uh, machines and, and things that that would keep uh, farmers going and, and the, the way they were finished and how they were painted. And they used to put the rings around the wheels with the paint. it would spin them round and with one brush it would make a nice line and you could see how the, well they were really finished in, in particularly hardwood for, for making things wear uh, for a considerable amount of time. Are there any wheelwrights still about today? There could be, there could be one or two wheelwrights uh, still about today, but uh, I don't think uh, they go under the name so much as wheelwrights, more as a, a joiner or a, or a carpenter. Excellent. Moving on to ornamental decorative work that blacksmiths undertook, Muriel Soden is asking the question, has the focus of work now shifted from shoeing horses to more decorative artwork? I think it has a little bit now. It has gone on from uh, uh, to decorative work. Uh, it, it has been much easier for uh, blacksmiths to work upon uh, for that sort of thing. But uh, as I've said before, uh, apart in the uh, farrier side of it, from the from the um, blacksmithing side of it, uh, sort of uh, left the blacksmith with uh, little else to do but to go into other methods and finding his way. In a, in a business that he could uh, make it profitable to him. And so the, the, the ornamental side has come into it quite a lot. Would that have been uh, something like making weather vanes, that sort of thing? Yes, making weather vanes and uh, uh, gates and, and uh, all types of uh, ornamental things, like baskets and uh, fire grates and... Uh, dog grates, wood burners and all this sort of thing has come into the smithing side of it. Do you have many souvenirs, blacksmithing souvenirs? Lots of blacksmithing souvenirs. I keep a, a full range of all my tools still still by me, so I've got a lot of souvenirs in which I have uh, time in which to uh, look upon and still bring them out for various uh, little jobs around the home. We're now going to discuss the tools of the trade tools for blacksmithing uh, what are the main tools of the trade yes the main the main tools of the trade you'll most certainly need first of all you'll need a forge whether it's a and a bellows or whether it's a uh, electric uh, variable speed motorized fan with it you'll certainly need need that also you'll need a 300 weight anvil and uh, you'll need uh, a swage block or iron former as is uh, but probably known and uh, you, you'll make your I had the, always the the uh, idea to make my own t tools like my tongs and uh, things that uh, I could make myself then I did make myself for the uh, for the trade and you also made certain things to suit certain jobs so you'd make uh, tools to suit those particular particular jobs you'd probably also need a set of rollers that you could roll metal and uh, into a circle you might also want to uh, uh, invest in a, a mandrel that you could uh, you could shape and uh, make rings and things like that and level things up with your, your mandrel on a, on the basis uh, of uh, certain uh, certain jobs of that kind. So the you you'd need a certain variety of uh, hammers, like a uh, a medium a medium sledgehammer, something in the in the region of about uh, seven pounds, working downwards to a four pounds. Uh, four pound ball, ball pane hammer 
but mainly you would also want which you would use most of your time and that is a, a two pounds uh, ball pain hammer so these are the main things you'll need to start the business you mentioned a swage block can you just describe what a swage block is and, and what you would uh, use that for yes a swage block is uh it is a piece of uh, metal that's about uh, looking at it from about 18 inches to two foot uh, uh, in in distance across it a thickness of about uh, six or eight inches around the outside of the uh, of the um, the block itself is various types of uh, uh, of uh, designs as to how you would uh, want your metal to look whether it wanted to be uh, flat with a with a corner shape on it um, partly oval partly part round and you could also f- make uh, other things like uh, if you wanted to round a piece of metal down you could also if you've got a, a blacksmith striker with you he would also be able to round a piece of metal down with the top swage using using the help of your striker so so these things uh, were formed on a uh, on a swage block and you'd also have a hollowed part in the in the uh, swage block where you could uh, form uh, making such things like a a ladle where you could put uh, solder in and things like that if you wanted to run solder you could also make a a, a ladle out of the uh, hollowed parts of the it had numerous uh, uh, sections in which you could shape various pieces uh, of metal you mentioned about making your own tools in the uh, olden days is that what they did with nearly all their tools yes a lot of the uh, a lot of the tools that were used were, were made uh, by yourself uh, going right into the uh, farming industry and and things like that uh, we used to make sickles and uh, and uh, dutch hose flat hose chopping out hose where you could change the blade from 10 inches down to four inch uh, by, by this method uh, with a swan neck uh, socket and also with a a long handle of about uh, four to five feet and th- th- there was lots of other things you'd have to uh, be able to uh, to make uh, uh, yourself uh, for various parts of the farming interest, you you did what uh, what was necessary necessary to do, and how the jobs came along. Teresa Charity is asking the question on the subject of materials. What kind of metals were used? Yes, we used to we used to use iron at one time, and uh, and we and this was bought in in uh, the long strip. It was uh, mainly used. Iron was mainly used because it was easy. To, it was easy to uh, work down. It, you could get it uh, white hot with, with the temperature, and it, you could also weld and make a good scarf weld with the iron and hardly see the weld where you'd uh, where, where you'd got to. And uh, these things would uh, would be better for it. Going on to the steel side of it. When you was making, uh, when we was making arrows, it was so easy, much easier to uh, work steel because uh, if you had to slot the metal and uh, put a drift or punch through it, the the, the uh, metal wouldn't crack. So therefore, you uh, you use the steel side of it. Anyone coming along and they didn't know the difference between between iron and steel, they, 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 there's a feeling that you get when you pick it a piece of iron up you'd, you'd know in your own mind and how it felt that it was iron but when you got a piece of steel it felt that much smoother so you knew it, you knew exactly which was which what temperature would the metal have to to be uh, that's the question that came came in from cheryl she's uh, says uh she also was asking the question uh, why did blacksmiths urinate on the welds now oh, that's a that's a fair question isn't it uh, yes, we um, going back, I say, uh, to the uh, to the time when we was dealing with iron and dealing with steel. 
you could uh, you could get iron a, a lot more uh, hotter than what you could what you could steal. Because my father used to turn to me and say, you know, if you if I'm making a chain or or something of that nature, you're dealing with steel now. So therefore, you can't get the you can't get the weld uh, so hot uh, as you can with the iron. So therefore. If you do, you you know what's going to happen. It's going to uh, you're going to burn the metal. So there is a difference between uh, that and the steel. Also, going up into the higher grades of steel, wh- where you um, would want to make different uh, types of tools. If you was dealing with a lathe and you wanted to make lathe tools, and uh, the the grade and the the yield was that much higher than uh, than what. Uh, other types of uh, metal would be so therefore you could never get that metal as hot as what you could with the, the lower down grades so you had to deal with it much more carefully and uh, and you could only work it when it was at a certain temperature and if you lost it with that temperature and it was getting cooler you would always crack the, the metal in the seam by by the vibration that it caused. So you, you could you only had a short period of time in which to work that type of metal. Thank you, Graham. Again, a question about Damascus steel. Is that a company name? And he's also asking about uh, folded steel that you would use to to make a sword. Uh, have you ever made a sword, or do you know of anybody who has made a sword? Yes, I I, I, uh, I have heard the name, but uh, it, it's it's mainly an area where it came from, and they would produce it and, and uh, make swords in that particular area where it would it would gain the name. So therefore. Uh, uh, Damascus steel or, or what have you would be produced in that area and the the item would be made uh, for swords and what have you going back many many years uh, into that uh, into that era of time also for the uh, folding of the uh, of the metals and uh, things like that it would uh, it would be made at a uh, so as it, so as the um, it would be able to be made on a softer metal so you could fold it without any out any fears of uh, of it cracking or or something of that nature, and then you'd be able to go through the process of hardening the metal after you'd finished working upon it. Graham is also asking, how has technology changed the trade? I'm afraid technology technology has changed uh, the trade. It, it's uh, it, it's got to a point, I suppose, now where the, the old ways of doing of doing the job in comparison to the new ways, then uh, th- this is slipping by. And therefore, uh, the, the new methods, and um, which are no doubt suits the time and, and period that we're going through at the moment, but going back to the older time, when, the, when we produced things on a traditional basis, then I'm afraid uh, those times are going. Tricks of the trade. Would you like to tell us about any tricks of the trade or any trade secrets you'd like to just reveal to our listeners? Yeah, there's lots of tricks in... There's a, there's a trick in every trade, they always say, and we used to find the tricks in, in our trade. And uh, I remember on several occasions when we've been working with different steels and uh, we've picked up the wrong piece and... Uh, We've suffered the consequences by it because it's sometimes you come across these uh, pieces of steel and they uh, they they work and you also uh, find your problems by accident. And I remember on one occasion, I was working with my brother and uh, on on a on a drag that we'd got in the in the workshop. And uh, when I took the uh, tine out to have it have it uh, repaired, I noticed that. By the sound on the anvil, it, you, it used to ring like a bell, so therefore that told me that the metal was very, very high, high yield steel, so you had to be that much more careful. And uh, my brother, when at that particular time, he wasn't aware, uh, I didn't tell him, I, t- I played a bit of a trick upon him by, by not letting him know what the quality of the steel was, and he found out by the... By the hard, by the hard way, and he laughed at me when he when he found a, the secret that I was keeping from him. But uh, there are tricks in trade, and and uh, we used to use we used to use iron, 
opposed to steel because it was easier for, like I've said in the programme, it's easier to work upon with a blacksmith and get it that much warmer. And we used to sometimes use iron opposed to steel. Nobody knew the difference, only the blacksmith. So therefore it was a trick in, in, uh, in sort of uh, working two pieces of metal together and one was what you wanted and one was what uh, you could work upon. So therefore there was a trick in most trades. There's, there's lots of tricks in in all sorts of uh, the side of it, like hardening of metals. Sometimes you have to know uh, when you're hardening a piece of metal that uh, the colours that you're looking for, and if those colours don't come about, you're defeating your object and you're going to, you're going to play a trick upon yourself. So you have to be... Uh, up with it when you're when you're hardening things uh, uh, like uh, various knives and and things like that. So you do sometimes get tricks played upon you by your by your own uh, self. Would you have used whale oil for anything? Yes, yes. Whale whale oil was a common uh, ingredient at that particular time in in our earlier days. It was all whale oil was always used for hardening of uh, of metal like chisels and crowbars and claw bars and and eel bars. It was always a a safe uh, ingredient in which you could you could dip your uh, metal in without having to worry about the harshness that it would cause upon the when you wanted to quench. Uh, the, the steel itself so therefore it was a it was a good uh, ingredient in which we uh, which we had but I'm afraid unfortunately that has gone gone out of the uh, business now I'm now going to ask about the training of blacksmiths can you tell me how did you train to be a blacksmith well I came into this into the business in 1947 and 48 and my father, when I first uh, went into his uh, business, there was quite a few uh, blacksmiths uh, with us at that particular time. And uh, I took up the training side of it through my father and my brother. And we went into all sorts of uh, periods like uh, training you to do various jobs, giving you time in which to... Uh, feel your way along, getting to know what the steels are, what the iron is, and how you work upon them. And I always used to find that uh, working iron was good to work with. You knew how hot you needed to get the metal. It would stand that much more heat than steel. But having said that, working with steel, when you, once you got the job done, it was always better to be with the steel than it was with the iron. Are there courses or apprenticeships available in blacksmithing today? Well, I don't know if there are any uh, apprenticeships uh, in uh, blacksmithing today. You, you, you'd have to go into the, the big industry if you could possibly get in. I don't know doubt that they are still training various uh, uh, pr apprentices with the uh, with certain uh, groups, you you may you may find smiths with the uh, shipping industry, and in a shipyard, and you also might find them. Uh, mainly, you would get a lot of uh, smiths uh, taking apprentices on in such places like Sheffield, where it's the heart of the uh, uh, of the steel uh, industry, uh, as we know it, uh, for making all types of of. Uh, tools and various machines so you'd you'd have to uh, go into something of like if you, if you could find your way into that uh, sort of uh, places in which to find somewhere where you could get someone to take you on Helen Anderson tells me that her grandfather had the blacksmiths at Houghton on the hill and she's asking uh, the question um, I'd like to ask what you most enjoyed about the job and also whether you earned a good living or is it more of a passion? Yes, you can You can earn a good living. You need to uh, 
be patient or you need to spend time uh, and you you can you can earn a, a good living by various uh, ways in which you can uh, go about your job i'm sure there's uh, uh, there's outlets in which you can find to make in various uh, various uh, tools i can remember on on one occasion there was one company that uh, we used to uh, trade with and uh, my father said to me uh, I've got a job for you. It's going to last you for several days, and I want you to make me five thousand staples for going into uh, wooden gates and and uh, make the hasps as well as the uh, staples. So that took me a period of time, and uh, and so there is outlets in which you can make a living by it. So uh, looking on the positive side of it, you you need you can make a living. A, a good living, uh, providing you're prepared to put the time into it. Did your customers pay you promptly? No, not on those occasions. Uh, it was always paid monthly, or sometimes it was paid three monthly. And if you got your money in a reasonable time, then you, it was uh, it, it was a bonus to you. But uh, it nearly always you 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 wouldn't get your money in less than uh, than at least. Probably two months. Barbara Boyce is asking an interesting question. She's asking, what is a whitesmith? Have you heard of one? Yes, yes, I've, I've heard of whitesmiths. They're mainly, all the, all the smith side of it, they come, they, they all deal with metal. They, 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 it's the time when the goldsmiths, silversmiths, whitesmiths and, and uh, all these type of... Uh, people they went into they was always dealing with metal as the whitesmith side of it would probably uh, he, he would go on to do the casting side of it at a, and you, you uh, with some company like in they'd they'd be running cast and and things like that. so the white side of it would be the white hot metal and and uh, dealing in the, in those sort of things but as i say all the smiths whether they were silversmiths goldsmiths or whatever they were there was always dealing in metal Gary Doolan is asking, um, you, I think a little bit tongue-in-cheek, I, I suspect, you, know, you could ask um, if they make metal clogs, as the way the economy is, is going today, uh, we'll all be wearing them soon because uh, we won't be able to afford anything else. I don't think we will, actually. We, we will be making our own clogs before we f- we finish, but, uh, you know, they, these are done. They, they, were, they were made, and uh, I remember... Having having to repair various people's uh, wooden clogs by putting by putting uh, steel underneath them, so they'd uh, they wouldn't wear the, the the wood out so much. But and this is where the probably the metal side of it came into it. But uh, at the moment, I don't think we're we're making too many metal metal clogs. Uh, Ian Smith is is asking a question. Ian uh, tells me that 20 years ago he was repairing an extractor fan at the Royal Army Veterinary Corps in Melton Mowbray and he says he had to go on to the flat roof when he found all dead horse parts, legs mainly. Would these have been used for training the blacksmiths or to feed the birds, he, he asks. Hello Ian, yes, most certainly they would be, uh, they would be dried parts of, uh, of horses' legs and they would be used for training purposes. They may have been put up there out of the way, but as I say, they wouldn't, they wouldn't cause a, a, a big amount of smell because they would have been dried out and, and treated in the manner that they could be brought out at any particular time for the, for the veterinary surgeons or, or those trainee people to look at them, and uh, they would also be told uh, out and explained to them as various parts of the of the legs, and and what they would uh, uh, be about. What special memories do you have of working in the trade? Lots of special memories. I've been in the, in the business for all these years, and I didn't just work uh, with my my father. I um, I had to do my national service. And when I came out of the national, out of the forces, uh, my father couldn't uh, take me on any longer because I, they couldn't pay me the wages that we needed. 
So I had to look for other ways in which to uh, uh, to to earn a living. So I I I had to go out and about, and I gained experience through these periods of years that uh, that I left my father. But uh, I went on to be blacksmith at the United Steel Company. I was also blacksmith for penny importers in uh, in Lincoln. Uh, Branston Engineering. I was attached to the uh, to, to a company in Sheffield, and uh, and I went on to uh, also uh, go into the Orcus Italy Group, which which was known as Blackstones in Stamford. So I had a reasonable experience with with all these companies, and I have a lot of memories by the different people and the other people that I was associated with. And the other blacksmiths that uh, give me a lot of, uh, they gave me a lot of experience, and uh, I've been thankful that I was able to gain that experience through these other people by taking that uh, that uh, few years in which I came back to my father in nineteen in nineteen sixty seven or eight somewhere there, and I continued the business right the way through till nineteen ninety three. Are there any other aspects of the trade that you would like to tell the listeners about that we that we haven't already covered? Yes, no doubt there is uh, a few things that uh, I'd like to see uh, come about probably in the trade. I'd like to see the introduction of uh, of the rural industries bureau probably again, so that it could train young young. Uh, possible working boys or or even girls because I know several several lasses now that are taking up the trade in various uh, parts there's a there's a lady blacksmith who is not too far from here I know her quite well she's uh, at North Kyme near near uh, Billinghay in that area out in in, in the heart of of uh, of uh, Lincoln Lincolnshire uh, and uh, I'd like to see uh, see that uh, uh, process come about again it would be good for, uh, for the uh, people concerned and also it would bring back the uh, smith inside of it in into uh, the community so i'd like to see things like that happen and also i'd like if there are any blacksmiths uh, that could still take an apprentice on uh, but at the same time if you haven't got a blacksmith you can't train an apprentice and you need to do this probably through the through the local council or whatever you could in whatever ways you could find in in bringing this about and one final question what do you think the future holds for blacksmithing do you think there'll be blacksmiths about in another 100 years time another 200 years time yes yes i do feel that uh, i know i know things are changing technology is all always changing and the process of uh, of how things are, are done today, but I do feel that uh, there are certain things that uh, you cannot do without a blacksmith, and so I do feel that uh, smithing will will go on uh, in in years to come. Thank you very much indeed.